Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hi, my name is Issei Nakajima Farron, former Terengganu player and a Pahang player、um, and Canadian international. You are listening to Bola Bola. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Bola Bola Show. And once again, you know, I'm here joined by my two co host buddies. First and foremost, Bala, how's it going? How's it even? It's been a good, good day. I think,、uh, despite all the situation, the football is still keeping entertained and keeping our minds straight. How about you, Elvin? Should be the yeah. same? Yeah, I mean, the same year and、uh, everything is going fine. You know, we, we've been watching a lot of football on TV.、Yeah. You can see, you know,、uh, some interesting, overhyped,、uh, <laughs> overhyped, <laughs> overhyped scholars draw yesterday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean it, was, it was fun. It was all fun, you know. There, 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 there were lots of、uh, fans who were inside caves who decided to come out and go back into their <laughs> cave. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but, but it's all good, guys. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, in case of our listeners, you're not aware of what's happening, what we're talking about, because、uh, we、yeah. are recording the day after the so called very big clash between Manchester Liverpool versus Manchester United, which I have to say, you know. Honestly, it's disappointing. I've seen better days between these two guys. <laughs> that, that, yeah, the last one、yeah. is one of those、uh, unmemorable ones. But we're not、yep. here to talk about the, that fixture. Yep, we have an、absolutely. interesting guest on board,、uh, all the way from, I mean, he's currently based in Barcelona. But、yep. as many of you Trigano fans will always remember him, Issei Nakajima Farad. So, with that said, we'll get straight on to the interview. So, today, guys, we have on our show a very special guest, a player who donned the iconic black and white Trunganu jersey from 2015 to 2017. He also represented his country, Canada, winning 38 caps. The Bola Bola Show is honored to have Issei Nakajima Farron on our show. Hello, Issei. Welcome on board. Hey, thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Great, great to have you. So,、uh, Issei, you know, we, we understand that you're currently based in Barcelona. So, perhaps you may want to share with our listeners what have you been up to these days? Yeah, so these days, if you guys are not following me on Instagram,、um, I am,、uh, I've been pretty busy in Barcelona. I mean, as busy as you can be with the, with the COVID happenings, but、uh, I've been playing a lot of football and.、Um, I've been training actually with a, a,、um, a fourth division club, third division club over here,、uh, because I think part of me doesn't want to give up football. I know it's been 17 years of professional football, but I think every 30 year old or every retired footballer says、uh, if your body moves and if you still feel good playing, then just play one more year because、uh, the afterlife of football is far more, far more longer. So if you could do one more year, do it, you know?、Yeah. So. <laughs> There was, a, there was quite a few clubs over here in third division that was kind of interested.、Um, it's close to my kid as well. That's exactly why I'm, I'm here in Barcelona. I have a son with my ex. So, and I, I've always been away from him because I was playing at you know, Malaysia, Cyprus, and,、uh, and MLS. So it's nice to be back here and not being totally kind of controlled by football anymore. I'm, I'm here because of my son. I want to be close to him. And if I can still play some in somewhat level and enjoy. A respectable level of football, then、um, yeah, I'm here to, to, here to enjoy. But with these clubs right now,、um, everybody's kind of cutting, cutting out the old guys and、uh, focusing on their young. And anything above third division, you're allowed to train and play. Anything below it is all postponed, I guess, until COVID has passed, which doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon. So that's when foot volley kind of kicked in for me and、um, seeing all these Brazilian guys.、Uh, Kind of just, just kill me, kill me on the beach. I thought I, had a, I thought I had a good touch, but these guys' touches are just unbelievable. These guys, apparently, when Ronaldinho was here, these guys were all playing with Ronaldinho and、wow. uh, I guess all Brazilians、mm-hmm. are always friends. So, <laughs> so they're that level of Ronaldinho. Well, I mean, I th- no, still, like if you're a footballer, you have a touch, you have a touch. It's simple as that. But football is just something else. Like because your standing foot slides in the sand and you still have to kind of focus on getting the right touch. And being close enough to the, the net so you can attack. I don't know. It's, it's a whole different ballgame. It's not Kopoleko, but what's that、uh, Malaysia,、um, <laughs> that 2v2? I always get it confused with Kopoleko. Kopoleko has more of an impact on me than the, 
<laughs> Sorry, what's that? What's that? It's like volleyball, but it's not. It's uh sepa takro. Sepa takro. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it sounds like kopoleko, right? <laughs> <Or not>. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I always get those two mixed up, but yes, um, it's obviously yeah similar similar rules, three touches, um, but you're on sand, so it's a, it's a different ball game than to being on a hard court where you can jump and can make those like uh, overhead kicks, etc. Mm-hmm. So there's been it's been a, a nice little challenge for me. Um, so yeah, that's what I what I've been busy with. But also um, the biggest thing for me actually is at the moment, which is a, a big question of whether I keep uh, trying to play or not. Which is for me, um, you know, being able to play in nine different countries and playing over what 14, 15 professional clubs, meeting all these different sponsors, players, agents, coaches. Um, I've always figured, I always wanted to know, like, why am I getting to meet all these interesting people, whether they're videographers or fitness coaches or uh, different brands, etc. And I always wanted to know, well, how can I tie this all, all, all together? And obviously the interesting footballers that I get to meet as well, who have a big CV, uh, even guys like, um, I don't want to, I don't really want to name drop, but like Thomas Mermelin, who was at uh, captain mm-hmm. at Arsenal and then at mm-hmm. Barcelona and now is in Japan. I get to meet these sort of guys and share the the similar situations that we experience in football, whether it's the pressure or the coach's pressure or fan pressure or confidence or you know chasing a two zero draw a two zero you know at sixtieth minute all, all these different things of what footballers can relate to, whether you're playing a high school level at the moment you're still chasing that win because you know at the end of the day it's all about winning and. After winning a game, you, you're going to feel fantastic in that evening. Just before you fall asleep, you, you're going to be recapping those good moments. And whether it's a FA Cup final, whether it's La Liga, whether it's playing in the Super League in, um, in Malaysia or whatever country or high school uh, or youth level, it's always going to be the same feeling that you reminisce with that you had that day. So, so anyway, so I was always trying to think, how can I incorporate this? Is it coaching? Is it agenting? I think everybody goes into agenting. I think everybody goes into coaching. But you only get to coach a certain number of players. You only get to agent or represent a certain number of players. And I always always wanted to be able to share this experience or share the, the... the people that gave me the advice or, you know, how can I rub this on down to the, the younger players so they can maybe cut a few years of growth into a span of, say, two months? You know, how is this possible? Because obviously the years of football that goes by, we can see how football is changing, how football is impro- improving faster or kids are making uh, earlier debuts at 16, etc. cetera. Um, and I thought this is clearly for me, the answer would be an app which is exactly what I'm trying to create with the guys from Malaysia, actually the guys from Telangana. I'm trying to create an app where I can give the advice. I can share all these interesting people that I've met, whether it's diet, fitness, playing, um, and give that sort of advice because for me to be a professional footballer, to reach a certain level or level in this game, or even to go to stay in the game. Cause I think I would love to know what the average number is of professional football. Cause I think a lot of guys do go pro um which is a very small number in in comparison to the amount of people that dream of playing professional football but once you do go pro do you like what's the average years i think it's like three four years i saw so many young players get their first debut but then two years later they're nowhere to be found and this goes to all these other countries too um and so to stay in the game is the next challenge to be pro yeah that, that is a very challenging task but then to stay pro uh, and stay in the game is a, is the next challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and how can I give that sort of advice? And for me, it's the biggest the biggest thing would be the extra training that you do outside your team, and whether it's on the ball or in the gym or or how you look after your body with uh, diet, the diet, the um, diet, mental mentally as well is a big task. How to control your mind? How to control that monkey mind or this self talk that continuously judges one's playing or you know those those type of things so i'm all i'm trying to put all that together in an app which is hopefully coming out in a month or two mm, okay lots of interesting stuff going on there and uh, yeah. you know of course most of us here would know your time in malaysia but before that you know i would like to go back to uh probably way back when you actually started to play for albirex digata in the s league am i is that correct 
Yep, that's right. And is it true that you yeah. were called up to play for for the Lions under twenty one team? Yeah, that's right. Um, so I was playing. That was my second year playing for uh, Albert Kniga the Singapore on loan from the Japanese side. And um, towards the end of the year, uh, Singapore, the Young Lions under twenty threes were actually playing against the Jap the Japan uh, under twenty threes and. In the history of Singapore, they've obviously never beaten Japan. And um, they invited me, another Japanese guy, and I think an African player. But as I understand with the FIFA ruling, a certain size of a country, if you play more than two years, you can, you can get their passport and represent the country. So that was the idea of bringing us three into the equation for the, for the national team. And, uh, but in my eyes, as a as a ambitious footballer uh, wanting to play in Europe one day, wanting to go back to Japan and play in the J league. I saw this as an opportunity to stamp my foot in front of the Japanese media slash the Japanese coach. Right. So of course it was a no brainer for me to say, yeah, of course I'll, I'll, I would love to play for you guys to try to comp compete against Japan. And um, so that opportunity came up, I scored a goal and scored the winning goal for the, for the penalty. And uh, then go out of the match of that game. And um, I thought for sure this would at least give, um, get the Alberics Niigata side in Japan to say, yeah, you say you've done well in the, the last two seasons. You were the top scorer in both seasons for the club. Now it's time for you to come back. But they never said that. Um, even though Singapore was still giving me a nice little offer for to represent the country. And it was a very, very... Very nice, uh, I guess, what do you call it, offer? Um, you know, where the living was all looked after. I was going to play for the Singapore national team, which is more than what I could potentially ask for as a, a player playing in the league. So for me, I wanted to say yes, but I had this feeling where I had all my Japanese side of my family in Canada. I, want, I wanted my second option was to, sorry, because I, I had Japanese, Canadian and British passport at the time. And I was a Japanese player playing for the Albrecht side. And I wanted to play in Japan. That's how I grew up. You know, as a youth player, you fantasize of playing in the first team. At, for example, for me, it was Tokyo Verity. And then Niigata, obviously, as well. So I didn't get that chance. And um, I had to prove myself otherwise, which Singapore was a great stepping stone for me. And the national team came calling up like that. So, um and I thought Canada could be the plan B where my family finally get to see me play for once. So I had to turn down Singapore, which I, I kind of regretted at the time. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, why am I not taking this deal? But my gut feeling was telling me that I have to go with Canada if they ever call. And shortly, the, actually the next day, the, the media was reaching out to Canada. I heard saying there's a Canadian Japanese guy playing here, he's doing well, you go young player of the year award. Um, and I think Canada just said, yeah, okay, well, good luck to him. Uh, but before that, the Japanese coach, uh, straight after the game, said, well, there's good Japanese players everywhere. So uh, we, don't, we don't think of calling Issa in anytime soon, but we, we hope, you know, for the best of him, uh, best for him. So J Japan pretty much shut it down immediately. Canada said, we're watching you. Singapore said, yes, uh, come on board. Uh, but the Young Lions coach at the time was Kim Paulson, this Danish guy who said to me that I wanted to take me to Denmark with him as he was uh, going to go back to Denmark. So I thought to myself, I didn't know much about Danish football, but I knew it was in Europe. So this was what I wanted. I wanted to not fully commit to Singapore. I just wanted to say, yeah, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm glad to be part of your history in beating Japan. But I, I need to play in Europe. I, this is where football truly lives. So... I wanted to experience that European football. Yeah, yeah. I think, does that, does that cover it? <laughs> yeah, it, uh, you covered well. Uh, let's talk about Malaysia then. I think you arrived in Malaysia to play for Chungano in 2015 after an interesting journey in playing Denmark, Australia, Cyprus, and also recently when you mentioned about Canada. Uh, mm. we, I think we would just like, like to know how that, uh, the move actually came about and uh, what is your impression when you first landed on, your, on yourself in Malaysia? And interestingly, the Chungano. Yeah, well, I was actually trying to go to Singapore, to be honest. Uh, my time was done in MLS, uh, which is a long story, but uh, that wasn't the question. Um, but yeah, MLS, my time ended as a Canadian. Um, and I thought, yeah. okay, I'm 30. 
usually they say you know footballer's career ends close to 30 and every year after that is a bonus mm -hmm. and i know some guys who retired at 37 so i i truly wanted to get close to what they achieved mm -hmm. um so i i wanted I, i thought singapore is where it started off for me not japan i mean yes my first contract was japan but singapore is where i kind of they put me in the limelight so I always kind of wanted to give something back to Singapore and be able to come back and say, thank you guys, because without you guys, I wouldn't have had my, my six year stint in, in Denmark playing UEFA cup and playing for the national team and playing in the World Cup qualifying, etc. I want to experience any of that un unless Singapore had this stage for me to play at. So mm -hmm. I wanted to come back to Singapore, but I think there was a lot of budget cuts and uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, uh, not, nothing really came of it, but then, um, I think it was LinkedIn, the app, LinkedIn. I put my all my highlights saying, okay, I'm 30. I'm a free transfer. If anyone is interested, um, I think Azerbaijan was calling uh, somebody in Iran. Um, there's quite a few other clubs as well, like in uh, Serie B. I think Serie B was uh, where I actually really wanted to go to experience some Italian football. But uh, part of me just kind of wanted to experience and go back to go back to Asia. So that's when LinkedIn kicked in and uh, this one agent said, uh, yeah, we see your, you have a, I don't know, it's a, it's a good looking CV. Would you like to come back? And I just thought Malaysia would be somewhat similar to Singapore being next door. So I didn't realize the fan base is far more greater than Singapore. Uh, lifestyle is pretty much the same. Yeah. Okay. It's a urban city, Singapore. And um, I guess it's only Kuala Lumpur that can kind of be somewhat similar to Singapore lifestyle, but, everywhere else was just untouched paradise and a beautiful place. Everybody's super passionate about the game. And I mean, that's what I first figured uh, first felt when I first arrived. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, when you Google Malaysia or Terengganu, I just saw palm trees, ocean, uh, saw the big stadium. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is what I, I want to experience. And uh, even though they don't, English won't be their first language, I always wanted to experience the, the language of football. That's why I always had the interest to go play in other countries where they didn't speak football because at the end of the day on the pitch, okay, a little bit of shouting of like a man on or one, two, but those are very simple language that, that we can all speak in, you know, it's just all understandable football language. So I wanted to experience that. I, I truly did. So when Malaysia came about, it was a, it was a no brainer for me to, to want to go challenge and go to the other end of the world to go, speak their football language okay awesome and uh, you know uh, your debut season was very successful you know you scored 13 goals in all competitions the team finished fourth in the league and was very unlucky not to make it to the fa cup final that year despite a memorable yeah. campaign reaching the semis and only losing on the dreaded away goals rules to the lions 12 from singapore so yeah. you care to share more about this what, what happened this campaign Yeah. Uh, well, you say I had a successful debut. Well, to be honest, I think after four games, um, or five, four or five games, I scored two or three goals. And then I got injured. I got uh, my pubis, uh, the ligament in there, snapped because we're about to play the semifinal in the cup against Young Lions, which I have a history with. And it was on my 31st birthday or 32nd. I think it was 31st. My 31st birthday. Is on the day of my birthday and playing against Young Lions where I want, you know, like I said, I know some of the guys on the other team because we played it. We played with each other and against each other 10 years ago. So part of me was like, I have to play this game. So they injected 15 painkiller injections into my pubis so I can so I can kind of fight through this game. The, the game is the option. Even the physios, everybody said this is a bad idea. It's going to make yourself worse. But am I going to back down? I mean, as a player, you're going to face those moments where it's easy to say, yeah, you know what? It's smarter. It's actually smarter to take a rest for another week before you jump back in because mm -hmm. you see a lot of players come back in too early and they get injured. So yes, I guess it was very stupid of me to take those 15 injections to be able to play the game. But 15. if you, if you guys are going to say to me, you say, it's up to you, it's your call. Then I, I will never back down. Like I, I'd rather die trying than, uh, Than taking it easy, for example. I mean, like I said, it was my birthday against Young Lions semifinal. So anyway, I went to Kuala Lumpur, got my 50 injections, came back. I felt great. I couldn't feel nothing. 
And then I think after 15, 20 minutes, I had a, um, a volley, which uh, I, I hit it well. I think the keeper saved it or just went over or something like this. But I just, all I could hear was this huge crack in my body. Ouch. And, oh. and that's when the pubis uh, went further. Um, and uh, that screwed me up for at least for two months. So for two months, I was out of the game. And this is coming, and I only signed a six-month deal at the time. Mm-hmm. As, you know, a lot of, as we all know, a lot of foreigners come and go. So obviously my agent at the time said, okay, well, he says his contract is done in one or two, three months. Are you guys interested in renewing? And everybody was like, well, he's only played four or five games, scored two goals. He's done nothing for us. Um, and then I was 80%. But with a pubis, you can't get up in the mornings. Like as you're lying down, you can't get up. You can't flex your stomach. You can't, uh, you can't stride or sprint. But my first game back, um, I scored three goals. But I only came on the last the last 20 minutes because they said to me, well, you have two or three more games to kind of prove yourself. And that's when I scored, I think, uh, I think it was like eight goals in like five games or something or seven goals. So that's when that stat came about and everybody started talking about, okay, uh, he stays back kind of thing. Uh, but I was only 80%. My stride, I just could not sprint. It, it, was, it, was, it was such a strange feeling. Something's holding you back for that last 20%. So... But the balls were just coming to me because I was in the right situation, the right time. Um, which I, I think it just comes with experience. And, uh, and I was clicking with these guys a, a lot better. So everybody was seeing my run. Because I'm not a guy that, you know, give me the ball to feet so I can take on whatever in front. Now, I, for me, the modern football is more attractive. It's better to beat two or three defenders with a simple one-two. Or you lay it off and then you run in behind and get that ball in space. And now your second or third touch is actually a shot on goal rather than you taking five, 10 touches to, and looking all busy. And, you know, I mean, that's what modern football is. It's using your teammates and getting the advantage, um, which I think a lot of young players all over the world um, or even the lower leagues kind of mistaken as a good player means that you get to dribble all through everybody. You know, the, the fact that you're attempting shows the level of your football. Because that's even Barcelona, you don't see these guys all trying to take on two or three guys. You don't see that. Messi does it maybe one in three, four games. But that's it. And everybody else can do it, but they choose not to because that's not the smart football. That's just uh, what I like to call it the Instagram football where kids are thinking uh, this is what a good player means, but um, to, to be able to do all the tricks, etc. So anyway, I, sorry, I, I'm going way off topic here. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, you said, uh, sorry, the question was um, about Malaysia. Sorry, but so yeah, 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 obviously, your, your, your I feel first rocked. Campaign, your first campaign, yeah, with the 13 goals. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that year went well, especially after I came back 80%. As, um, and then I insisted on signing two years. And I, um, and obviously, we were robbed in that semifinal, whether they say it's an offside or not. Mm-hmm. You know, our captain was... Yes, I understand. Uh, and when you look at the slow motion, you can kind of, kind of see. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. Know. I still think it was a goal. I don't want to. I don't want to see the replays. I remember that moment, and I was on the bench because I got pulled off um, against a Singapore team. Which, yeah, okay, they're invited to be in this cup, but it should be owned by a Malaysian team. And I thought we were very close. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sorry, you said uh, in the following season we were we were the favorites, right? Because we did so well. But that's I mean, also uh, because I mean we can notice that the following season optimism must have been very high for Trungano after that campaign. But yeah, seems like you yeah. guys got relegated. I mean, what did all go wrong? Yeah, so that was a a big because I mean I remember before the season we were the favorites to actually win the league. You know, wow. media was covering us, and uh, we we're on the front cover of whatever, I don't know, a lot of magazines. And Mm -hmm. I know we were the favorites because we had a a good tactic. We had had everything in place, but we just didn't quite have the backup because, I mean, we had two injuries, which was Gustavo and Ismail Faruqi. And Gustavo is a a super talented guy where he's a 360-degree player. He doesn't have the speed, but it's like Iniesta. Iniesta does not need speed. He's a player that's just pure finesse. And no matter how hard you try to take the ball off the guy, the guy can just go wherever direction he wants. And same with Ismail Faruqi. He's that sort of uh, playmaker. And Gustavo snapped his uh, Achilles 
in that in one of the games. And then Ismail came on to replace him as that kind of playmaker. And he did his uh, ACL. And from that moment, we never really recovered as a team. And that was oh. early on in the season. So it's one playmaker after so... another getting ACL injury. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And for okay. me, for me, like I said, I'm not a guy that give me to feet and let me try and take on three or four guys like some of the some of the other wingers these days. Um, I'm like I said, I'm the guy that I'd rather hide in behind the shadow. I mean, the shoulder of the defender and then making a diagonal run because Gustavo Ismael knows that, you know, I'm running along the line. So as soon as they get their head up, they already see I'm on my bike, you know, and you just have to put the ball just behind the, the defense line in front of the goalkeeper and, I, and I'm on it. And majority of the goals that I scored were just like that because I like to hit the space. And I think modern football is about hitting the space when you suck the other team into certain areas. And that for me, that's what modern football was. And that was clicking so well with uh, the guys that we had on the team at, um, at that time as well. Guys were all moving around. Like also um, Mayo. Mayo too was moving a lot. Uh, with the front three, including me, Mayo and... Uh, uh, who else was it? Uh, I can't remember. There was quite a few guys. But it was always kind of the same system. No matter which attacker went, went in, we always had a, a good backup in that front three. But in the, the mid three, where these guys are supposed to be feeding us these uh, through passes, well, both of them, our main two guys just got, uh, yeah, like a big, big injury, which took a hit because now creating chances was, wasn't happening. And, uh, and that screwed up a whole season. Mm-hmm. And Tenegano at the time, we're known for this tiki-taka team. We, we play the ball on the ground. There's a lot of movement. It's, it was beautiful football that we were playing. I mean, we were, I so, remember so many times we were giggling to each other because it was such, it was one two-touch football, which for me is the most attractive football. And then the, obviously in the last third, you do what you, what you believe is uh, going to make the difference. But everywhere else, 80% of the pitch, you should be, playing the smart tiki-taka football and trying to get the advantage with the one extra player by sucking the other team in. For me, that's the smart football. And Terengano, that's what we were playing. So, mm, Okay. Yeah. On the positive side, you decided to stay with Trungano for another season and help them to win promotion. Any mm. reason why you decided to do that, especially in a foreigner, especially successful, you are used to be actually after the team relegated, they jump around, but why you decided to stay in Trungano and in fact help them to get promoted in the following season? Well, I mean, in those in that year and a half, I, I grew really fondly with uh, with the fans and with the city, uh, with some certain cuisines that I think everybody knows me from, um, because I, that's something that I discovered myself. And I was like on the Instagram thing, you know, saying, how come this is not international, you know? Mm-hmm. Like certain, like, I don't know why fish and chips from England has gone international or... <laughs> maple syrup is amazing, but maple syrup, of course, <laughs> has gone worldwide with whatever pancakes. I mean, every country has their little thing, right? Like Indians, uh, you have your curries and your, your tikka mm-hmm. masala. Yeah, it's amazing. It's all over the world. So how come this fish dish, nasi degang, hasn't gone across the planet? Like, this is amazing. Like, who has this for breakfast? And this is amazing. And I, was, I just kept going on how amazing this thing is. Like, how come nobody's caught up on this? <laughs> and, uh, and that kind of blew, blew out a portion of like, this uh this Ipo Gila loves this nasi legar and he won't shut up about it okay. so so i mean that's how that that started so anyway so i, I had this kind of soft spot for Terengano for those year and a half and for me also Terengano because all the because it's a government run team it's not ex footballers like in other countries okay the chairman might be some money guy with a whatever whether it's royal family or a big big uh, corporate whatever business but usually sports directors and these things are are run by footballers who have been in the game who understand the the game more than more than fans or more than anybody that's i mean there's a lot of pundits so there's a lot of people that understand the game but when you're in the game it's a it's a different story that's why experience goes a long way and i and i thought Tenengano had so much potential because you obviously have the big stadium you have the fans and you have the money so how come you cannot be the best in the country you have those three hardest things to attain, yet you have it. So why are you not the best? And for me, I started questioning the, so, so why is this guy in power? Or, I mean, I, as a foreigner, I shouldn't be questioning those things, but a lot of fans were provoking me to like, speak my mind, speak my mind. So again, not only 
was I speak in my mind? I was kind of in touch with these, with the, a lot of fans and how everybody was wearing my jersey, even if we lost the next day. And I, I've never seen that in any other country. So I, I just kind of fell in love with this passion for football in, the, in, in Terengano. And, um, and as a foreigner, after a year and a half to come and go, uh, and I've always been that foreigner who come and go because it was another better contract. Um, and so I, if you see in my, in my history, yeah, it's one or two years and I, and I bounce. I, I go to the next club because they offer me better money and a better situation and maybe a bigger role to play in, which would be my next challenge. But for the first time, I thought to myself, after repeating the same kind of, uh, you know, that same situation, I thought, no, I'm not going to run away and go get a better contract. I'm already 32 or 33. I want to stick it out here. I want to fight for these people. I want I want them to see how I've been through what they've been through being relegated and fight back to get promotion. And if we can do that in one year, I think that shows a lot of character as a player. So it was a different kind of challenge for me rather than just go enjoy my next game, next game. No, this is like, we have to get the result. We have to win back promotion and have pride in, in the city again, right? And that, so that's what I truly thought. And I thought doing that would probably secure another one or two years with the club as like a foreigner that just loves his city and loves his loves the people that really wants to make a difference with the football but obviously with Ifran coming in um I don't think he liked that the fact that I was too uh vocal in the problems in Terengganu or uh what a professional footballer should be should be treating himself or or doing or even what the club should be doing and I don't think he he needed that in his team. So of course we won the promotion, and he was like, "All right, well, thanks for your your contribution, but uh, you're done," kind of thing. So, so which was yeah. I mean, I took that too hard. I mean, I I put my my guts and love and passion into Terengganu. I didn't think that it would just be replaced so easily. Um, but that's football. So you go replaced super easily. Um, another Japanese guy came in, or Lee Tuck came in, etc. And that was just another another guy on the history books has been here and done that. So, okay. um, yeah, yeah. And in uh, and in you know 2018, you went on to play for Pahang, the neighbors, and uh, and that was actually your final year in Malaysia. So, was there any offer for you to continue to stay in Malaysia after that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, playing for Pahang, it was uh, it was nice mm -hmm. to be part of a a big, uh, you know, equally if not maybe even bigger club. Um, even though I always thought Terengganu could be the best, but they remain where they are and they remain where they are because of the system that they're in. So anyway, so that's their problem to, to solve one day if they ever get to see what the problem is. But anyway, the point is that, yeah, I got to join Pahang. Um, I was supposed to join in January, but uh, I think, what was it? A Fokido uh, was injured. He, he, he lingered around and... Um, I think it was a Sunday. So I was supposed to sign the last day of the transfer window, but Sunday, nobody was working. So I couldn't sign the papers and I had to wait for the next window. So I was training with them. And finally I signed to play the last half season. I did all right, to be honest. I think it was it 11 games or 12 games, um, seven goals, I think it was. Um, but obviously I enjoyed my time there, but it wasn't the same. I didn't have the same feeling as I did for Terengganu. Yes, Pahang was great, but they never treated me the way Terengganu did. So it was just another, okay, well, I'm enjoying my football. And that's all I have to worry about is just enjoying my football. Uh, whereas Terengganu was something else for me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I did all right. Uh, I think in the be beginning, there was always uh, a lot of criticism towards me. Um, which is fine. I think any big club would always have that criticism against certain players. Uh, you see that in Premier League. You see that everywhere. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm used to um, that sort of that side of football as well. So it did get to me. And if you look at my stats, okay, uh, I think six, six, seven goals. And I'm not even a striker. I'm a winger. So I think my stats uh, spoke for itself. Uh, and then to be not part of the, the cup final, which was the third, for me, a third cup final that, my team wins, but I didn't get to play a part. You know, I played in the semifinal, but not the final. And uh, so I kind of took that little sour, bitter taste. Um, and, uh, and yeah, shortly after that, I think PDR, yeah, PDRM gave me a contract, a deal. 
in 2018. I, I signed it. I took photos with the coach. I took photos with the coaching staff. And then uh, I said, okay, I, need, I just need to fly back, pick up my things in Spain, and I'll, I'll be right back. And uh, I think two days later, the chairman just canceled the contract. So wow. I said, uh, so I was asking these other agents and lawyers, I'm like, can you do that? Didn't I just sign, you know? Yeah. And yeah, we could have gone in that messy direction, but part of me just didn't want to make, uh, I didn't want anybody to kind of dislike me for trying to, trying to find a club or trying to get money for for not doing or not playing, right? So in the end, me and the lawyer and the agent were saying, okay, well, let, let. it wasn't a, a big contract anyway. So we are like, you know what, forget this. And that's exactly when uh, Canada just started their Premier League. So they were asking all the Canadian national team players to come back and help promote and play in the league and get this league uh, established kind of thing in 2018. And my ex-teammates were the owners for Pacific FC. So these guys were like, well, because I told him, like, yeah, I'm like, Rob, Josh, you guys have been, um, I'd love to play with you guys or play for you guys. But uh, I just got another, a decent deal with PDRM. So I'm going to play one more year and then come back. But then, uh, so they chose other players to represent their, you know, their main mm-hmm. core of the team. And then PDRM kind of played dirty with me and somehow said, no, we want a bigger striker. Even though the coach was like, he said, I like that. If you were a striker, I see you more of a, a very, a player that's going to be making runs, you know, and that's what he, he wanted that movement in the, in the front three. So I said, I, I honestly love playing that role, especially with certain, if we have certain players who have their head up, um, who can have that vision, then I'd, ra- then I would love to play striker because it doesn't matter where I run. As long as I le- if I leave the defender, you're going to put it exactly where I want it. So if you have a guy like Ismael Faruqi, Faruqi or um, Gustavo, I think at the time they had some some guy that they're saying, yeah, this guy will provide you the passes and let's let's win the promotion so we get into Super League. So, so yeah, that was that was the idea, but uh, the chairman screwed it up, and I think they did pretty bad that year. So no hard feelings. Um, mm-hmm. And then I I went to go play. I guess that would be my last year, 2018, in uh, in the Canadian League, where I played a a role of kind of helping the younger players um, mentally and some advice on like running, you know, right, running diagonal or, you know, the attacking concept that, that I was kind of good at in my career. You have been capped 38 times for the Canucks and, you know, what's your take on the current Canadian national team, especially now when they have young superstars like Alfonso Davies around? Yeah, well, I mean, media coverage on Canadian football is a lot better than than it was, for example, 10 years ago. Because, I mean, the guy that's in charge now, uh, I remember for the media side, uh, I can't remember, sorry, I, his, his name doesn't come out. But anyway, he um, he was just a hustling guy who came to these uh, away camps with his phone, just recording us and saying, yeah, how do you feel? You know, you're coming straight from English Premier League or, or La Liga, like Julian de Guzman coming straight from uh, Deportivo, like Atiba coming, playing Champions League against Arsenal and being told that he's one of the best players by Arsene Wenger. Like we had all these guys, sorry, but the media that we had back then was a guy coming, showing up with his phone, interviewing us and, him posting on, on whatever whatever media. So we didn't exactly have a professional media because football by the government side weren't funding as much as they would fund hockey, for example. And we were at the same level as how much the government was funding for the U.S. national team because I had U.S. national team players playing with me, at, for example, FC Nochelen. So, for example, our, our game bonuses were the same back in 2000, what is that, 11 or 2008, 2011? Uh, my first cap was in 2006. So for the, the following five, six years, we were the same level as U.S., except for U.S. had more had more players in playing in Europe. Um, and both national teams were really only taking guys playing in Europe seriously. If you're playing in MLS at the time, you weren't getting called up. Um, so if you were playing regular games in the top league of Europe somewhere, you were kind of called in. But the problem with the national team Canada was that we only had 20 guys to select or no, I would say 40 guys to select that was playing in Europe and playing every day. I mean, every game as a starting member, whereas us had a hundred. So if we had injuries, we didn't really have much of a backup. And in comparison to, to it is now, I would say we had far more guys playing in Europe at the time. 
I mean, every country has their problems. Like, you know, Malaysia has their problems in both Singapore also, Denmark also. Uh, but Canada, our problem, I mean, I know the problems, but when it comes to the Canadian football, is that the ladder or the structure wasn't in place. So if you're coming from, uh, you're playing at some whatever academy, you're 16, you, you want to go pro, you want to go play at a, a high level academy. Well, there was no option. Like, okay, they were playing games, but it wasn't considered professional. So even if you were kind of graduate, graduated that team, at say 18, 19, where do you go next? You only had a university and maybe try to get a scholarship. And then still, what after, what after that? What, try and get into an MLS, I guess, would be the, the closest. So we had more guys leaving Canada at the early ages of 15, 16. Like my, well, I'm, I'm slightly different. I, but everybody's kind of same as me. Like grew up through the youth system in Europe and then made it in Europe, or well, for me, Japan, but... Um, so that was, so when you compare like, the guys were playing in, you know, we had Thomas Rosinski playing at Fulham. We had Sol Terry at Tottenham. Um, at, like I said, Atiba FC Copenhagen going to PSV shortly after, uh, Julian de Guzman, our center back, um, Kevin McKenna, who was the captain of uh, Cologne playing in Bundesliga talk. So you guys can, so kind of like, I mean, the media, yes, it's fantastic right now. Alfonso to, to go as far as he did when that, uh, you know, going straight from Vancouver Whitecaps to winning Champions League a few months, I mean, six months later. It's just unbelievable. And yeah, he's the first. But football is a team sport. Just because you have Alfonso doesn't mean you're going to win anything. Um, and if you look at the on paper of all these guys, yeah, there's a lot of media coverage on this guy playing in whatever country. But... I can honestly say it's, it's not as many as we had back then. Um, and these guys were all the, the guys that was playing with me, even though I was considered playing in Denmark. Yeah, that's a small league. And then what my teammates were playing in, but everybody was playing uh, first 11 football. We weren't sitting on the bench. We weren't, uh, we were playing every game. I like for me too, I was scoring goals. So yeah, I mean, people say it's, it's better now, the Canadian football. But I would have to disagree. We just it's just better marketing. And that, that that's really it. We didn't have that sort of marketing back then. Mm -hmm. okay. So but that's our Canadian problem. Uh we didn't have the marketing back then, and now we do. But again, there's only a, a small handful of guys playing in playing in Europe. You know, there's a couple guys playing in the CPL, which is still not as considered well, it's not a respected league whatsoever yet. I think it will after the World Cup. Um but that's the whole point. It's good that Canada has finally taken the initiative and not trying to be bossed around by the American MLS and actually start their own league so you can grow your own Canadian players because the three teams that's in the MLS, there's literally only four or five Canadians per team. So it's not a Canadian team. I mean, that's why I left MLS because I was like, this is, I always wanted, I was Canada being part of the national team is where I felt the most being a local player. Everybody was like, mixed blood and playing somewhere else you know english is not the main language and i felt truly like these guys these guys are my brothers they're just like me julian's a like half filipino you know atiba different countries everybody's like you know some other some other countries mixed in so everybody was just like me like for the first time ever i'm not a foreigner i'm a local player and uh yeah it was just so i totally lost the, my train of thought there um yeah so sorry um yeah so we were part of the oh my god I totally lost it man I totally lost it the structure yeah. <laughs> yeah um so does that answer your question or am i missing something we yeah that's yeah 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 basically you you basically just yeah uh, i think we understand your, uh, where yeah, you're coming from your take on yeah you guys yeah all right I mean, of course, yes, uh, Canada seems to be benefiting from having one Alphos or Davis, but I, I believe what you're trying to say is that it needs 11 more in order to be seen as a competitive national team. That's, I guess 30 that's right. more, I mean, man. Yeah, 30 more. 30 okay, more. there you go. There's injuries. There's always injuries, you know? Okay, so, all right. But that, that's the Canadian problem. And it's, like I said, it's good to finally initiate our own league. So now players have somewhere to go after being 16, 17, and also... Uh, early stage of their professional career, which at the at the moment that's the league's problem. The league is seen as a youth team. It's major, the average age is like 21, 22. But that's what they want because they want to sell more players like Alfonso Davies and make millions. Yeah, that's great. 
but I was um, part of a different podcast where who, who wants to watch youth, youth football? You know, football, men's football is, is considered men's football. 21 year olds with no experience or, or coming straight from university playing in what's considered professional Canadian football wasn't so, you know, it's one tempo. There's no experience in the game yet. This is, this is what they want. And, but this is the Canadian football problem that, I, well, I would say eventually they'll, they'll get past this because there'll be guys getting more experience, more games under their belt that the game will be a little bit more attractive to watch. Because, yes, right now it's considered professional football, but if you look on paper, the experience that any of these guys have had is nothing. So that's the kind of football you're getting, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. But well, it, like uh, I said, every country has their problem. Yeah. But um, I mean, that Canada is, is in the right direction. Yep. Yeah. I mean, uh, among all the coaches that you played during your playing time, I mean, and you've been to so many places and all that, I mean, which one, which particular coach that, seem to have the biggest impact on you and what would you like to share with young generation footballers from that coach okay well there's two coaches um that definitely uh that i definitely think a lot about is obviously my my one so the negative side let's talk about my my youth coach um this guy he went pro at 16 he retired like 25 or something a japanese legend and uh it was at tokyo verity at the time and he always told me that I wasn't going to make it. He always told me that, I mean, he made one comment one day saying, foreigner, go home. You know, and I was the, the Canadian British that can speak Japanese playing in the youth system. Wow. Okay. And I was never favored. I was never, I was always on the bench coming off and scoring a goal. And then I'll be on the bench again. I'll come off the bench, I'll score a goal as a winger or a striker. So I always left stats. But in my mind, I was, I, I truly thought also, I was like, yeah, yeah, coach, you, you're, you're a very respected coach. I think I, yeah, I think you're right. I'm not going to make it. Maybe I'll, all I have is one day try to get a scholarship in some university. Maybe that's, maybe that's what it is for me. But if you put me on the pitch, I'm going to go 150% and just try and do whatever I can. But after the game, he would say, yeah, I say, uh, you, you, can, you should be doing this. Uh, you need to have your head up more. You need a better touch or whatever. You know, it was just always very critical and, um, I honestly thought I was a crap player because of the things that he said to me, but I still had this burning passion just to prove him wrong. And till, to the very last day of my contract, or even like, I'm still, I'm, I still think about this all the time. Like I want to keep playing because I want to prove this guy wrong. So even as a young player, having a, a very critical coach or a parent or a friend or anybody, or even media, you got to use that as motivation because that is the only reason that I fought and I wanted to run more than anybody else in every game, in every last minute or the last 10 minutes of every game. I, I wanted to sprint more than anybody else because I had that guy in the back of my head that disrespected me or saying I wasn't good enough. And I just wanted to prove him wrong. And any, any media that came from Japan asking me, yeah, you've had a great career. Nobody saw it coming. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Because that guy totally burned me down. But because of that guy, I can now truly say thank you, even though I think it was more the F word towards that guy. But really, it's, <laughs> you know, I because I had so much hate for this guy. I was like, because he just did not respect whatever I did. Even if I was a top scorer in that tournament for the club, okay, three goals. But still, that was more than anybody that you, you were saying that these guys are going to be pro, forwarding them to the top team. Uh, in my age group, so every youth team, you, you'll have about eight to ten guys. My age group, there was like, I think about 10 guys. I think four of them were supposed to go pro. Um, one's a goalkeeper. The other three uh, were good players. They're playing, you know, the J Japan national team, et cetera, and the unders, whatever. And highly respected growing up. And Tokyo Verdi at the time was, you know, I, I would say it was one of the best clubs in, the, in Japan. Um, they had the, the best history and all that and the best facility as well in Japan at the time. So these guys were a big hype. Well, in the end... None of them go to experience national team football. None of them experience UEFA Cup. Okay, mine's only a few games. They didn't experience that. Um, play around the world and and rub shoulders with guys like Robinho and James and you know these top level players. And and I did. And that, but that always kept me going because I had such a, I would say a good coach, but very judgmental it was never positive 
And you got to, as a young player, you got to use those in your favor because it can really just fuel you and just keep you going. And like, I, that would, even the fact that I'm still talking about it just gets me going. Like, I want to go play for somebody just so I can score a goal and hashtag this coach. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't have Instagram, but anyway. Um, and then the coach that I, I highly respect would be uh, Ange Postacoglu, who's the uh, head coach. Australian coach. Australia, yeah. So after Brisbane, he went up to uh, coach the Australian national team for a few mm -hmm. years. And then now he's in uh, Yokohama Marinos and yes. won the league last year. Um, everywhere he goes, uh, his pattern is that, I mean, even Brisbane at the time, uh, me leaving Denmark, I, I guess I had an ego leaving Denmark. I canceled my contract because they didn't want to pay the transfer fee. Uh, not many people know this, but, and this would be an advice to other footballers who have contracts. So one way to get out of your contract, I don't know if we can talk about this, man, but, but screw it. I'm not in the game anymore. It doesn't matter. So if you say to the club, even though say you have one or two years, I was like, I'm sick of football. I quit. I don't play anymore. And and they're missing out on the inv investment that they've made or they paid me however much money. They bought me from FC Northland as well. So there was a lot of money involved or the amount of money they invested. But I got sick of the cold. I'm getting blue toes every week. And then, you know, to release that pressure in your toe, you got to drill your toe to release the blood. And I did that every week. It was so painful because it's so cold. So after six years, I got sick of it and uh, uh, it was actually through Facebook. I said, okay, I, my contract is done in like a year and a half. Anybody uh, interested? They said, yeah, Brisbane is the, the champions of Australia that year. Uh, the following season, they want you, but they, they don't want to pay the transfer fee. And then the coach called me and coach was like, he said, can you, can you get out of your contract? I'm like, coach, I'm not going to cancel my contract if you don't put anything on paper. I mean, how stupid would that be on my end? And so I had to convince the club that I was like, you know what? I quit. I don't play anymore. This is, uh, this is, I, I don't have the love anymore. And you screwed up my brother's career, which was a package deal at the time, which I couldn't say no to because you're going to sign my brother. You're going to sign me at the same time. This is my dream. This is our dream. Me, me and my brother's dream. Paris, Nakajima, Paris. So, so we both signed, but they never treated him the same respect that they treated me. It was more like they sucked him in, sucked me in. So, and that became very evident. And I felt very sour towards the club on how they treated my brother. So, so with that included, I wanted to leave the club, but I knew I had a contract. I could get out of it, but I was so pissed on how they treated my brother because I'm the older brother. You know, I, I look out, I, I look out for my brother all the time. So anyway, they treated that like crap. So I said, you know what? I quit. And they said, okay, we're signing a paper that you're not going anywhere in Europe. You can't sign anywhere. If you do, here's your, here's your transfer fee or here's the big fee that you're going to have to pay. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll sign whatever you want because everything is within Europe. And then a week later, I signed in Brisbane and uh, joined this champions, champions team. So hey, that's got nothing to do with the, <laughs> the respect that you guys are asking for, for our coach. So anyway including myself, just an average professional footballer. Um, our team didn't have any like superstars yet. We won the league again. And I, I never thought I would say this or respect a coach big enough to say, while well, the coach did it rather than the players, because I always truly think it's the players that, that fight on the pitch. At the end of the day, the coach can say whatever you want for a week, but that the game day is up to the players to perform. And if the, the coach doesn't bring it out of you, that's, that's the limitation of the coach. But what he did with us was almost brainwashing us in this system of like no long balls, no crosses, no uh, certain movements where the right back will go into my position at right wing. I'm going in the middle to replace uh, the holding midfielder. The holding midfielder goes all the way down to right back. The simple triangle just frees up so much possession in the game. Because the midfielder is not going to go all the way and mark the other midfielder, which means at somewhere in, on the pitch, we're, we're completely, we have more guys um, around because we, we have this certain movement. And this is exactly what it does in Marinos and all the J-League teams are copying this guy's strategy. Um, and I, I only have so much like respect. Total football. It's say. total football, yeah, because mm, it's okay. such a simple game. And all the games that I played in with, the, with Brisbane, it was like 80% possession. It's unheard of. The media was calling us uh, the Barca of Australia. Wow, a, okay. So, and that's exactly how we were playing. You know, we were just 
no crosses because there's still the possibility, uh, the probability of us scoring after a cross. It just isn't big enough compared to a pass and a shot. So I, I still remember I made a cross. We scored next day in the in the video. Um, what do you call it? In the recap of the game, I'm getting told off for making a cross. I'm like, yeah, but coach, but we scored. But no, this is not the kind of football we want. Or I scored a, a long shot. Again, this is not what we want from you. You say we want this foundation of understanding or philosophy of football that you are supposed to have four options and shooting or crossing is not one of them. I'll make sure you're going to have all these other options, but shooting and crossing is not an option. Wow. So one guy got freedom, which is a German guy, and but everybody else has to follow the system. And no matter how good that I did, I was always criticized as well. And for me, at a young, I, I wouldn't say young, but yeah, I think 20, what, 27, 28? No, 28, 29. Uh, they told me, and at me, I wish I didn't have that ego that the that I recognize now because the ego was telling me, no, I say I'm coming from Europe. None of these guys have had European experience. These all like Australian players only played in Australia and whatnot. I had this ego that was kind of deteriorating me, deteriorating my my positivity. So uh, I was getting sick of getting told what I can do and can't do, even though I was doing well. So so that didn't go, that didn't end very well for my time there, even though, even though we won the league. But now looking back, I was like, that, that guy was a genius. You know, I wish I would, uh, I mean, I had options to stay there in, um, I think Adelaide and Perth was calling. But part of me is saying, no, I don't play in Australia anymore. It's too much like MLS. It's too, it's so, you know, a lot of marketing and uh, the level is not great. All the experienced guys, because the majority of the time, like if a guy comes, comes on trial or a guy just signs, the usual conversation is, oh, so where were you at, man? They usually say, oh, I was in, uh, you know, I wasn't playing. I was in Holland. I wasn't getting games. So I'm, I'm in Denmark or playing at whatever top team. So they all have like experience. And that's the beauty of playing in Europe. You play in MLS. It's like, oh, I just came from university. I got I have no experience. Or same in Canada or in Malaysia too. You, you don't hear guys playing. In, even the foreigners, you don't hear guys. Yeah, I was playing in Europe and I'm you know, playing my, my 30s in, in Malaysia. No, these guys played in only Thailand and Indonesia. Okay, so you haven't truly truly felt the, the beauty of playing in Europe because it's not easy. It's not easy to go play in Europe. It really isn't because it is the highest level of football in anywhere in the world is to play in Europe, you know, to see your goals in the, the Euro goals. For example, like I remember seeing my goals so many times. It was such a nice feeling to see my goal after, I don't know, Slatan and Inter at the time or whatever. It was so nice to be part of Europe. You know, it was always on every day, the Euro goals. The, the best goals from around Europe this this week. And then to see your team it, alongside all these other teams, it, it was amazing to see. I don't know. I don't think they have that channel anymore or, or whatever. But um, uh, the, my point is to have a conversation with where, you, where you're from. Because you, know, uh, you might have a, a friend in common or a player that you know, because football at the end of the day is small if you've experienced a certain level of football. So it's like, oh, yeah, I knew a Canadian guy there. Yeah, you play with him. Yeah. So then we take a selfie, send it to our, to our, to our buddy saying, yeah, we're playing, with, we're playing together now kind of thing. Whereas the lower level you play, that conversation doesn't even exist. For example, like Malaysia or, or Canada um, or even MLS for that matter. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's just uh... <laughs> I'm going way off topic again. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I keep doing that. Man. I just keep talking. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, yeah. No, no worries, man. Because you, 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 you have a very colorful career, you know, all around the world, and basically lots of experiences here and there. So I'm sure, lots of stories there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but like I said, like Ange Postecoglou, that coach was uh, he's a breath of fresh air for me. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, to play this certain system where. And to the way you teach it as well. It's not just uh, talking on a whiteboard saying, this is what I want to do. And hope your players actually get it. It's from the warm-up, the shadow play in the warm-up, to the possession games that we play, to how we interpret that into the attacking third. Is it was genius. When I think about it, that's, that was the coach. And no wonder um, the city group have signed him. So I think, you know, one day he's going to be a man city. Because... Wow. You do bad the first year because they truly – so the club also needs to have the patience because even the two years before Brisbane when I went, he was just fighting relegation. 
And th that's when he stepped in fighting relegation, didn't do great, but didn't get relegated. But he's trying to teach all the players a certain philosophy and anybody that kind of went against him, just go fire. And brought in guys that were just true, truly hardworking and go with the whole system of the movement and keeping the touches as minimal as possible. Mm -hmm. He did the exact same thing when he went to Marinos. He didn't do well the first year. And then the following year he wins. And it's, like I said, same in Australia. He, he, he won the league the following year and then won it again. And of course, now everybody's talking about the coach. Australia signs him, but he's not really a national team coach. He needs to be working with these players every single day. So I wasn't surprised when he didn't do great with the national team, but has now moved on to a bigger, a big league such as Japan and um, signing for a very well-established club. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because at the end of the day, where you see a lot in Malaysia as well, or around the world, is the coach that comes in and just says, okay, you play, you play, you play. And I, I hate to say this about Ifran, but this was exactly what Ifran's uh, tactics, you know, like, and I, I hate that about myself that, or even the, I'm sure all these other guys who experience top level football and you come to Malaysia and you see a coach just saying, yeah, uh, you, you play and you play and today we must win. I'm like, is that it? And you're the <laughs> highest paid coach in Malaysia. Are you serious? You can't be serious, you know, but, the, but, but so, yeah. So I can see why some well-experienced foreigners come and go uh, the well-experienced ones. No, because the, the philosophy or the football smart is just not there. What we thought was common sense is just not common sense. So, but, but yeah, like, that's not what football is about. It's not about this guy, that guy play. And even if you're injured or you're 50%, you still must play. Yeah, this is for me, this is not tactics. Tactics is, is the true movement, how you want your team to build up and to keep the ball rather than saying, you play, you play, and you just, good luck to you, all the best. That is not tact that's not coaching or tactics. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's okay. high school football. That's what your high school teacher should say. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Sorry yeah. to say this, but it, that's that's the truth. And I've said to so many fans, like, how's it for? I'm like, please just come to see training. Please just come to see our training and you because uh, I don't want to speak negatively about the coach because I'm, I'm I was part of the club at the time. But you'll see at the end of training, I'm doing one two with the coach on the edge of the box and shooting, and everybody's lined up. Okay. So you got 20 guys doing one, two of the coach. This is, this is for real. You'll never see that ever. If you go to Europe, you go see training, right? Guys are waiting around for like five minutes until they get one shot doing a one, two of the, of the coach. But again, certain people don't know any better, right? Mm -hmm. It was, it was for me, it was truly embarrassing because I have friends that visited or my, or my parents that visited or my brother, you know, who would also be a professional footballer to witness the level of the training. Or the philosophy of the training and to see me doing one, two of the coach on the edge of the box and then getting in line behind 20 guys and to know how much money Tenengano spends. And this is, this is what you're doing. This is what you think you're going to be a champion. Come on, man. But <laughs> me speaking out loud didn't do me any favors. I thought maybe some people would say, yeah, you said you're totally right. But again, like, who am I? I'm just kind of burning my own bridge, you know? But at the time, I'm passionate about football as well and, and what a player should should do or what coaches should do or what a club should do. Yeah, they didn't want that sort of outspoken person. And I'm the only guy, uh, so I guess I'm the one that uh, took the hit, right? So, but I, I'm glad that I, I spoke my mind and some people maybe see what football should be because of that. Cause I did say that to a lot of Tenangana fans and stuff. So, but everybody was provoking me too. They said, please, you say, speak more, say more, say more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Seems like we had a lot of serious uh, conversation here with Issei. So, you know, let's, uh, you know, we would like to end this uh, podcast with, let's talk about something a little bit more fun. So what yeah. we're going to do here, yeah, we're going to ask you a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Something that is, something about that is favorite to you. And you're going to have to answer within the first five seconds. Do you think you can do that? Yeah, but does it have to be a short answer or a long answer? <laughs> <laughs> this is going to go long, man. I can't give you short answers. Okay, so, so, so it'll be some quick fire ones, you see? So, yeah, right, you know, I'll try to keep it short. So, so, right. Yeah, okay. so, so for our listeners to get to know you more on a personal level, yeah? So, right. so let's get cracking. So you say, what's your favorite pet? Dog. Dog, great. Okay. Wow, okay. 
Your favorite drink? Well, Titari is in my mind now. So I'm actually having Titari now, but a very crap version of Titari. So Titari. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, and uh, okay, what, what about your favorite musician or artist? Oh, wow. Well, I got to represent my Canadian guy, Drake. Uh, okay. Oh, all right, okay. All right. All right. How about your favorite movie? Oh, favorite movie. I don't know. I watched Mulan last night. That was crap. <laughs> or even, uh, or even uh, was it Wonder Woman, too? I watched that the night before. That was crap, too. I was like, what the hell? So I don't really have the good one in my mind. I only have the crap ones right now. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. So and I, and lastly, you know, what, what will be your favorite holiday destination? I tell you now. <laughs> I gotta I gotta say Corinthian Island. Ah, oh, okay, 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 okay. Right, right, yeah. right. Okay, so so you, you so I suppose you really enjoyed your time in Trangano going to all these islands. Yeah, it was beautiful. It's untouched paradise because majority of the paradise is already let's say touched <laughs> mm, okay. and overgrown and overdone and etc. And yeah, printing was just so it's it had, like, like Terengano itself. It has so much potential yet. They remain the way they are, which is also the beauty of Terengano. So that's why I also love Terengano because I, I guess you're, yeah, you just don't know how to be or to grow as a city or even a football club, but that's, that's, you know, like, it's like a renovation. I, I love renovation projects, but mm -hmm. and I see that as a very big renovation in the city slash uh, the football club okay. and slash Caribbean. But that's the beauty of it, uh, and I love that how how the mentality and uh, you know I just love I love the people there. I love uh, the food there. And the ocean was fantastic, even though we all know it's dying slowly. Um, but it's a beautiful place. I loved it. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. All right, guys, any last questions before we wrap it up? Please, uh, please let me post this. Yeah, let me post this, man, on sure, my Instagram. Yeah. We'll, we'll, yep. we'll definitely uh, inform you, definitely. Yeah. yeah, so if you guys are not following me yet, 11 Issei, please follow and my app that's coming out because I think majority of the people that follow me are, are guys that want to be a footballer or guys are, who are already a footballer. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference that's going to make you to be a footballer or to stay in the game. And that's what my app is about. And um, that's why it's called Only the Ambitious because, and uh, also the logo is like just a hexagon that represents the O and the other is the A. So out of all the other hexagons, there's only one that's really truly determined to be somebody in the game. And, um, and that's what I'm trying to reflect as all my experience and all the guys that I got to meet and Everybody around the football club as well. I'm trying to tie everybody in and trying to show what a young player needs. And also the parent, uh, because it's also the support that you must give the kid as a 10-year-old, for example, or a 12-year-old. So that's exactly what I'm trying to do. If you guys could uh, share and subscribe, yeah. <laughs> sure, definitely. No problem. Yeah, we'll do sure, that. No problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Guys. All right, guys. Yeah, we, we, we look forward to the app. And, you know, thank you. Thank you so much, Ise, for having coming on board the show and, you know, sharing and speaking your mind here. Yep. <laughs> yeah, please yeah. invite me again. There's a lot more I can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. Once again, thank you for us. Uh, we had a wonderful yeah. time with you and uh, looking forward for more uh, talks with you, especially. Yep. Yeah, have, thanks, guys. Perhaps when Appreciate all this it. is over, we can uh, one day sit together for a tetare and you can share a small mm -hmm. your story. Nasi Daga. Yeah, you know? Nasi Daga, yeah, yeah, definitely. It, <laughs> yeah, if this COVID ever goes away, then I'm coming back. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, okay, all right, with, that, with that said and done, uh, we will end this uh, episode of the Bola Bola Show. And once again, thank you, Isi, for joining us. And goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.